Welcome, everybody. I'm, uh, I'm Steve Azevedo. I uh, got invited to, since I'm back for, in Washington for something else, to NNSA to do this uh, a talk for the Strategic Partnership Program, which I didn't know existed in NNSA. And um, uh, so I'm going to be speaking there next week with this talk. Uh, and we thought it might be a good idea to do sort of a dry run, because it's a lot of memories from 25 years ago, the silver anniversary of the MIR starting. And um, and I want to be sure I didn't forget everything, and and I didn't remember them wrong. I probably did remember a lot of it wrong, so you're going to remind me. But just write it down or email it to me later, okay? If you remember what happened. Uh, thank you. So anyway, thank you for coming, and thank you to uh, Roger and the rest of the IPO staff, Sarah and Connie and and Hannah and company, Richard, and uh, for supporting me on this because it was kind of a walk down memory lane for me. Uh, uh, because I, I joined the program at around in 94, and I'll get into what sort of what happened then. But let, let's let's just get started here. The, the, this is the uh, the outline here. We're going to talk a little about what what MIR is, is what's ultra wide band or impulse. Uh, there, there's liable to be a, um, a lay audience back where I, where I am, so I'd be happy to give a little bit of that and talk about the origin of the MIR. It's commercialization. I'll go into detail on that, and then at some of the government programs we have and then uh, beyond. Uh, it's actually interesting that Edward Teller commented on this and said it was, interesting, it was a, a really good invention because of its simplicity. I think uh, the inventor would agree with that too. We got a lot of, or the inventor and, and others got a lot of, uh, of uh, notoriety for this, in particular that popular science article in March 95 and the one next month from New Scientist with front cover on the radar and you know, talking about the impossible burger of its time and, uh, you know, be a somebody with a ray of art. We just thought that was pretty cool. But anyway, you'll, you'll see what the, uh, what, what the big deal was. But we'll start with a simple chart. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, uh, this is the uh, radio frequencies chart put out by uh, the FCC and NTIA. And it's, um, you know, each of the decades from zero to 300 gigahertz just so we can kind of talk about this here. I, I'm not going to go into detail, obviously, but it, people spend a lot of money and time, you know, in, investing in a little sliver of this frequency spectrum so that they can transmit in there. And, and since the radar actually involves transmitting, I want, I wanted to just get this little background out of the way. There's AM radio and FM radio are kind of buried up there at the, at the high end, or at the, at the low end, I should say. And then down here are the higher stuff. There's a... Uh, TV, broadcast TV is right right there. And uh, the more colorful stuff is down further. So you have GPS here and uh, two Wi-Fi's at 2.4 and 5 gigahertz Wi-Fi's that you probably have in your house. Um, and I wanted to point this out because uh, well, let's highlight a certain part of that spectrum right there. And that's this area here and, and over here. And uh, here it is from you know a little less, about 1 gigahertz to 10. Um, and, and you can see the GPS, oops, sorry. You can see the GPS up here and, and the Bluetooth and Wi-Fi and microwave ovens and so forth. Normally, they're narrow band, right? In, 19, in 2002, the FCC opened up this ultra-wideband spectrum between 3.1 and 10 point whatever 6 um, for unlicensed use if you keep it below a certain power limit. That didn't exist in 1994. We were doing stuff in that range, and uh, I think actually, you know, the inventor and, and the lab actually had something to do with establishing that. There were others as well, but um, but now it's established in, in 2002 that you can transmit at a low low power down below the noise level, and they then they have the limits there. Uh, just to give another orientation, since we do at this laboratory, we are using everything, the whole electromagnetic spectrum, all the way from from radio up to gamma rays and, and particles and acoustics and everything else to measure things. That's what we do here at the lab. And signal processors do that all the time. So I wanted to point out where this is on the, so that chart, that whole chart there is just right up here, radio and microwave. Uh, and the reason I want to bring that up is, is for one, is to show what the wavelength is because we'll talk about imaging a little later too. Uh, in order to do imaging, you kind of have to be around the wavelength of the, of the object. So, so we're in the area where wavelengths goes from you know a kilometer to down to uh, you know below a millimeter, and so there's a 
th there's a chance maybe we can do imaging with this, with this device if we can figure it out. And I'll show you where the, uh, the ultra wideband sits right here. It's actually the wavelength for ultra wide, that ultra wideband band is three to 10 centimeters. Okay, so that's a little, little bit. It, this is uh, also kind of de defining what, what we mean by ultra wideband. So normally, you know, when you're putting out AM or FM radio or whatever, you, you, you've just got a s standard frequency there and then you modulate it to, to send information, voices and whatnot, AM with amplitude, so you move it up and down, or FM with frequency modulation. And, and in, this, in the frequency band, it's very narrow. This is that same chart from the last slide. It's very narrow. And then if you go what's called broadband or spread spectrum, then you start, then you start adding a little bandwidth to it, but you also use more of the coding. There's, uh, there's various different kinds of codings that can go on in order to send information on, on those spectrum. A lot of it has to do with pulses and so forth, so you can share the spectrum. And uh, engineers have gotten extremely good at sharing those little bits of spectra that they, get, that they get. But ultra wideband, in our case, what we're talking about here is impulse ultra wideband. You can make ultra wideband other ways. Chirp is one, you change the frequency or others, or just with white noise. But, but we, what we're talking about here is an impulse ultra wideband. And when you, when you have impulses like this, it spreads the spectrum quite a bit. And you can see it's down here, and it, get, it gets actually below the noise level. You can't detect these things with a standard you know, narrow band detector because it's just way down there. So that's what micropower impulse radar is. That's how the inventor named it. Uh, it, it uses microwatts of power drain. It was a very clever design. It's, uh, it makes an impulse like this. It's like, it's like snaps, you know, it just keeps, just keeps snapping. Only it does that millions of times a, a second. And, um, and it looks like random noise to conventional radars, radios or radars. And at the time we started it, it wasn't available for license, but we, uh, at, at least in the FCC, as far as the FCC was concerned. And of course, at the National Labs, we are, we're good at impulses. We deal with impulses a lot. We measure impulses a lot. And uh, so, time, uh, so the, the guy who invented it, that's Tom McEwen up there. Um, he was hired here in 89. He was a, uh, just a master analog circuits guy and had worked on electric, electronic countermeasures for Northrop and other places. He was very, very clever, very good engineer. And uh, he was hired here to work on transient digitizing, measuring very fast events off a Nova laser, right? And uh, so he came up with, a, um, with this invention, which is called the transient digitizer. It was patented in 1992, and it was a 93 award winner. Three, 33 giga samples a second. You couldn't buy something like that at the time. And, um, and that, that got him thinking. By the way, there was another person on that patent. Anybody know who it is? He's sitting right up there. Joe Kilkenny <laughs> was, was the other guy in that patent. You've had a lot to do with it, right, Joe? Yeah. Um, anyway, he, uh, he came up with that. And then he, he'd also gone to a, he, he mentioned a, uh, in 1991, there was an impulse radar classified conference in Los Alamos that he attended. Uh, not for little impulse radars, but big ones. And, um, and it, that got him thinking too. And it got him thinking maybe he can come up with a receiver for a, a small radar, right? So he built one in his garage, brought it into the lab, and uh, decided it might be patentable. So they did. The ultra wideband receiver was patented in 94, about the time when I came. And that's the, kind of the basis for the motion sensor. And uh, got another picture of Tom here. He's also built various other things out of it. Fluid level sensing, so you send a pulse down a, a rod or, or just in air, and you can measure how high the, the fluid levels are. And that was patented later. And then range finding is something a signal processors like a lot. You, you, you actually change the, the range that you, go, that you are sending the radar, and you can get a signal out of it. You can start making images with it. You can start doing a lot with that, with that kind of thing. So, all these patents were started from Tom, and um, out of that came a lot of really interesting ideas of, of things for in automotive industry. I won't describe all of these, but home security, appliances, uh, and lots of things in manufacturing. Here's the fluid level sensing right there, and and uh, and then and communication. So a lot of these things, he started started patenting them. You come up with ideas, and let's just put another patent in. And the lab was uh, was pretty good about letting him do that and, and, uh, and 
encouraging it, and Hank Sartorio was the head legal then, and he was writing up all these patents as, as fast as Tom could come up with them. And, uh, and uh, then Bert Grant, or, uh, no, Bert Weiss, no, but uh, Bill Grant, sorry, Bill Grant was uh, helping with the, with the licensing and, and you know, trying to get licenses started, which was something, well, it was something totally new to me. Maybe it was something they were used to, um, but to see all that. Anyway, since 94, 197 patents on this. One of them is still active. All the rest have, have uh, passed on. Um, the first 24 of those patents were part of what was called the licensing portfolio. So it took a little while for them to get all 24 of those in, and then that was what they sold to companies, was that whole package. Um, and, uh, and the next bullet says there's 30 licenses, and over since, since 2005, there's been a, you know, almost $12 million. There was a lot more before that, but we don't have the records for, for what. So I, it's probably closer to $20 million that came in in royalties. That's just to the lab. An equal amount went to the inventor. So he did pretty well. He left the lab. And he really re later received 30 more patents, 34 more patents, and started licensing, licensing those, you know, belt. He, he licensed his from the lab and then, you know, had more. Um, anyway, it's the second biggest royalty revenue uh, of the lab, and it created a lot of interest. Somehow, you start talking about a $10 radar that's really small and easy to use, and people come up with great ideas, right? So that's what kind of happened, and it captured the imagination, and lots of things happened. This is one of the um, one of the early units that came out, uh, actually from Central, one of the licensees, a motion sensor. In fact, I got one right here. So it's a motion sensor. It looks like really one that you put up in the corner of the of the wall or whatever, and uh, and it had both the MIR, or they call it ultra wideband, and a passive infrared. So that's kind of kind of cool. There actually was products that came out of it, and it was, it was useful. And then this was kind of the biggest money maker, I think, was Magnetrol had, had uh, fluid level sensors, some that were here where you, you uh, don't have a, a rod going down. You just measure the height of the fluid. And, and this one here where you use a rod, and you could, if you had multiple layers of the fluid, you could measure those layers. So that was, that's pretty cool. And uh, what else? Oh, there was a sleep minder, which was a radar up here. To, and they started getting wacky, okay? Uh, uh, you put a radar up here and watch how we sleep, you know, and see how that, see how that works. Uh, the Kohler actually was one of our licensees, and I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say this stuff, but, but uh, they were early on. And, and, uh, and so all these, you know, for toilets and for, and for soap dispensers and whatnot, where you see these kinds of things, that might be ultra-wideband. It might not. It might be. I don't know which ones were really done, so... You know, don't ask me, but there was a lot of royalty income that came in, so there was, must have been some sales of, of a lot of these different things, and these are companies that did license with us. Uh, Zircon actually did two for stud finders and walls, and you can buy them now that have a radar in them. In fact, Bosch uh, has one. This is, I just found this on Amazon last week. If you want to spend you know, $700, you can get an ultra-wideband radar technology floor and wall scanner. There you go. So you know, again, that's probably not, not using the MIR, clearly not now, because the license, the, you know, the patents are already uh, done. But it's, it's just kind of interesting. You can see this all over the place. If you look up ultra wideband, you'll see a lot of different things. Oh, yeah. Mattel contacted us, uh, Tom. And uh, they had him come down to this factory, their factory, and they wanted to you know, talk to him about putting a radar inside of toys, including Barbie, to if the, if the child comes close, then it would wake up or do something. And talk about spooky. I, I think that would be, <laughs> I don't know how. But anyway, he went down there and saw them, and he came back with a Barbie doll, which we thought was funny. But he, he, uh, he had to put it way back in his workbench. He didn't want anybody to see that he had that. Um, oh, we had golf people. There's a lot of money in golf, at least at that time, wanting to you know, find distances to things, including where the golf ball went, all this stuff. I mean, there it, it was a lot of wacky things. Ah, this is Jeff Baxter. Uh, I don't know how, if you guys all know who Jeff Baxter, Jeff Skunk Baxter, he's the uh, lead guitarist for Steely Dan and, and uh, Doobie Brothers, and it became, and it's a story that should, we should do over beers, but, it, uh, but he was an advisor to the laser program because he was an expert in, 
ballistic missile defense or whatever. Anyway, he, he uh, came to the lab, and one of the things McEwen built was the first radar guitar, first and only. No one's ever built one of these, so he took, the gut he took a regular guitar, took the magnetic pickups on the back of the, uh, an electric guitar, put in a radar that measured the movement of the, of the strings. Um, and it worked, you know. <laughs> so uh, there's Mike Campbell, he had lasers at the time. I don't know how much drinking was involved in this, but uh, anyway, we got the, a picture of them together with the radar guitar, which uh, I thought was kind of cool. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, there was a lot, of, a lot of stuff that went on like that. There was just odd people coming in and, and in being interested in it and whatever. Anyway, but with the notoriety came an attack. So there's a company called Time Domain Corporation, or Systems, and they, uh, for whatever reason, I won't name the fellow's name, claimed that there was an earlier patent that he had but it, was, it wasn't the same. It was pretty clear to most of us who, who read it. It wasn't the same. But a wealthy backer that he had, was, he was very intense, and he, and he lobbied his congressman in Alabama, and, and it, was, it was a nightmare. So that they somehow got really damaging articles about the laboratory, about Tom, about this radar um, out there. The worst one was in USA Today. Right, Steve? <laughs> Wampler here was a big part of that. Um, and Time Magazine, I mean, this is the national news, right, that the big bad laboratory, you know, is, is damaging this poor fellow, and it was, it was pretty bad. The one that hit, hit me, or our, our group, the worst, was this uh, California Public Records Act request that we got for all the MIR documents, which was a real pain, and uh, I, I had 30,000 of my documents went, went to them, and uh, I know IPO, Connie, you had a lot of <laughs> It was terrible. It was a nightmare. And we kind of remained silent. We kind of referred to the patent office because we had put in, um, we had put in a request right here. It took three years to, f to figure this out. We put in a request for this one patent that they were, the, the main patent, the receiver, ultra-wideband receiver, which had 20 claims in it. So we had lots of reviews, so reviews inside the lab. The management was not thrilled that we had this bad publicity, right? They, they uh, wanted, to be, wanted to get this over with. The UC was involved. Uh, the patent office, I went with Tom at least once to, to the, talk to the examiner, and we were, we were good about it, just kind of describing what the differences were, and actually described a few more claims that should be on that patent. DOE got involved, of course. They didn't like to hear bad news about their laboratory. Congress with the Science Committee. I mean, it was a nightmare. It really was. By uh, May 1998, the first action came from the patent office that eight of those claims were okay. So that's great, but you know, it wasn't complete vindication until a year and a half later, just before Y2K, <laughs> that uh, MIR was found to be totally different, fundamentally different, non-interchangeable, all 20 claims were okay, plus 29 more, plus many, many different references. So basically, we won entirely, but three years later. So. Uh, it, it effectively stopped the licensing of MIR. I'm not sure we had any licenses after that. Do we know? Uh, 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 it, was, it was pretty bad. By the year 2000, it was bad. So what did we get out of it? Oh, and then Tom, this is the releases that you guys gave me from, uh, from McEwen, but his lawyer put, in, put out a lot of uh, releases in, in 99, and the final one, it vindicates Tom McEwen as inventor of the breakthrough technology. This is a wonderful read, actually. Uh, I think I have a copy of it. Uh, they, they really hammer this time to make preparation. Um, and rightly so, that was just, uh, I, I was very surprised that people could, could do that in, in, in you know, whatever. It was just the, the amazing story. And this is what we got out of it, yes? In March of 2000, a little bit after, we got a little correction down by the <laughs> table of contents. <laughs> The U.S. Patent Office, which initially rejected the patent claims, now conclude that, pat that McEwen's technology is valid and reaffirmed the patent claims. And it says, talks about the House Science Committee Minority Staff Report to come under fire. Anyway, that's, that's the sum total of what we got out of it, which didn't, which uh, <laughs> I know I got Steve Wampler. <laughs> Sorry, I got him upset again. Look at him. Um, because I know you put out a lot of press releases saying, you know, we, we uh, really did well on this, but oh well. So that's all I was, oh yeah, one, one other thing is I, I did get an email from Tom uh, just, just this month, and um, 
and I asked him for lessons learned. I won't go into these in detail, but this may be of interest to you guys and, and to NNSA that uh, uh, of ideas to do if you're going to patent something here and, and, you, and if it gets really popular like MIR did, then what do you do about it? Yes, sir? Are the slides going to be shared? Uh, yeah, yeah, I think they'll be public. Oh, yeah. 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 Anyway, um, it, I'll, I'll just say them quickly. Make, make good tech notes of the patent, you know, summary, so that it's easy for them to turn it into a product. That's a good idea, right? And, and he thought we should license the individual patents rather than doing the 24 that we did before. He's probably right about that, too. Uh, I mean, we didn't, we, we, we did it the way those guys wanted to do it at the time. If it's popular, then you gotta be ready uh, with a quick response to them, you know, a, a nice letter, here's how you license, here's, uh, here's how you pay, <laughs> and all those kind of things. Uh, he said, Tom, well, you know, who knows, we might have gotten 100 more licenses. Uh, anyway, he, he, um, he says, don't worry about, oh yeah, don't worry about the licensees patenting ahead of you. He apparently had this worry, and, and uh, I, I suppose I would too if I had done a lot of patents, um, that you, know, you, you licensed your patent to a company, and they could go out and then build on that and, and make a new, uh, new patent. But uh, as he said, they don't have the right employees to do that. At least in his case, the guy is so brilliant. You know, I, I think he—he's like a lot of these inventors. Uh, yeah, anybody would have thought of this, but he did. <laughs> and so, um, but and then and then the last one was to limit the contact between licensees and PI. Tom spent an awful lot of time with these licensees, and that's kind of part of the reason he left. And I think uh, the laser program would have liked to have more of his time to work on the digitizer and other things, which they hired him for. And it changed, it changed the, the dynamic, and that's kind of partly why he left. Um, uh, so it was too bad. It, but just make sure that it's clear that the, we limit the contact between the inventors. Anyway, I'll go on to. <laughs> so now, let's talk about other programs. Uh, that was kind of what, what I was supposed to do, work with Tom and you know, get ideas and come up with where, places we could use this in other, in other areas. And so these are the areas of defense and weapons, security, uh, infrastructure, a lot of work on that, and medical were kind of the main five areas. And I'm, again, I'm not going to go through all of these, but just to give you an idea that, that there was a lot of stuff there. And out of it came six R&D 100 awards over the years for one thing or another. There was 12 SNTR articles. Early on it was ENTR, Energy and Technology Review. And, um, and at the height we had, a, you know, it was a, not a huge program, but it was, it was running fine. We had 20 million a year about. And uh, most of those were R&D projects. And now I'll describe a few of them that we, that we focused on just to give you an idea of what, what happened. Oh, first of all, there, what were the things that we were selling of this, te of this technology to people? And of course, it's the small, lightweight, rugged, and so forth, which is all the stuff that was part of MIR, really low power, battery operated, which was pretty unique. And but it also had a fine range, range resolution. You could get a good. Uh, you could find things in space very accurately. And uh, you know, if you put a bubble of a motion sensor out there, it was a sharp edge on that bubble. Um, it's very difficult to detect. I mentioned a little bit about this, but low probability of intercept and low probability of detection was the buzzwords for the military. And they liked that a lot. So we did a lot of work with them. Uh, it's resistant to countermeasures. It's really difficult to jam this thing. and. Um, in the, some of the communications devices people have been trying to, and, and it's difficult. There's a, oh, the high pulse rate, which is uh, kind of more technical, and it's multipath and sensitive. Uh, but it also, you know, penetrates lots of things, concrete, wallboard, brick, round, tissue, things that aren't conductive, very it's highly conductive. So it won't go in water very well. It won't go uh, in metal. Um, and you can make it into arrays for imaging. This is what was always interesting to us a lot for 3D localizing. We did tomography with it, and I'll get into some of those as well. And then, of course, we also sold what we have, our whole the laboratory strength of design, prototype, data processing, analysis, testing, we, and including automatic threat detections and, and recognition and so forth. Um, so we brought a lot to the table besides the MIR uh, to our projects that we had. So let's go through a few of them here. Obviously, the troop protection is very much like, in fact, I got a few of these little devices that we built for one thing or another. There's that device there, and it's just meant to put
put it down and, and um, it, it was actually set up so that you could sleep inside of the bubble, you know, and even if you moved a little bit, it wouldn't, bother, it wouldn't detect you, but if somebody tried to come in the bubble, it would detect it. So it was kind of true protection one way or another. So I'll just put these out here. Uh, and then we went on, on with that and came up with this technology called, called Guardian that would be an air drop one. I got one of those, built a few of these, and it's set up so that it uh, right itself if it, if it turned upside down, it got a battery, and radio and controller and so forth. So that was another one. We built a few and tested them. Um, what else did we have? You can ask questions if you, if you ha want. Yeah, go ahead. You want me to go into that, multipath insensitive? Um, well, since we're, uh, I think I mentioned it's a, it's a time domain. It, another word for impulse ultra wideband is time domain radar, which means we're not you know, looking for the encoding. We're looking for the pulse coming back, and only the first pulse coming back. So multipath means you can, uh, ra radars have this problem that, that uh, it'll bounce off of walls, off of other things, and you'll get multiple returns. You get the first one, which is the key one. How far is it to the thing you're pointing at? But you also get this other noise that comes in. With impulse, it's less sensitive to that. Uh, you still get it, but you're looking for that first pulse. You're doing it in the time domain and so you can find it better. Make sense? Yeah. Good, good question. These were, um, the Army had some munitions that were, uh, they do their work best if they don't detonate when they hit the ground, but if they detonate when they're 30 inches above the ground. So we built a bunch of these little radars to test whether that could happen. And, you know, so here above sand and above metal, it was pretty much, you know, pretty close to 30 inches for all of them. We drop them and then and then uh, have a video, watch it as well. And so we did a bunch of testing with this and delivered a bunch to the Army and so forth. Anyway, that was, that was a pretty cool one, too. Um, this one, we were working on, uh, on this radar right about the time when the V-22, uh, you might be familiar with, is, is, uh, was just coming out. Bell Helicopter built this out of Arlington, Texas, and we went to see them. And it's a, it's a um, vertical takeoff and land aircraft, right? So it, uh, it starts out as a helicopter, and then when it, when it flies up, it, and it's amazing to watch these things do this. It flies up, and then it kind of tilts forward, and, and all of a sudden it's flying as, a, as an airplane. But they, the technology going into these, tr these three rotors, uh, the uh, blades that they had there, were very, was very touchy. They wanted to be sure that it was, that it was just right. They needed to know uh, in real time th that uh, those blades were, in, particularly in helicopter mode, that they were the right height, that they were not fighting one another, that, that everything was working fine. So we actually built a radar. This one ended up being 96, 95 gigahertz, but it was MIR type innards on it. Uh, very small, hooked into the aircraft, and would measure the, the height of the blades you know, as, it, as they spun around. It was pretty cool. As far as I know, it's, it's still on it, but I don't know uh, for sure. Um, and oh, it worked in all weather and operations and whatnot, so that was kind of, kind of nice. This, I, I think, is still in operation too, if anybody's from HEAF. Um, so we put uh, radar antennas around an explosive or something that's exploding. They wanted to measure the, the velocity of the wave front coming off. The radar bounces off of the, the wave front as it comes. And so you can actually measure the velocity of it. It, it, it destroys the uh, antennas by the time you're done with it, but that's all right. You replace those next time and, and uh, you can get a nice measure of it. And you can also do it with, this was a bullet coming into a, uh, a big sand pit that's on the other side of this wall here. And so we put big antennas on that one for transmit and receive and uh, we're able to get position versus track uh, you know, measurements off of that too. So I, I think they still use this as a, as a radar diagnostic for their, uh, in HEAF, yes? How is the balance of change between what they disclose and what the Army disclosed uh, in terms of their... You're talking about um, for this talk? Uh, yes. Okay. The question is, how, how do you de de determine the balance of what to disclose and what not to disclose on this? Uh, well, of course, we go through the 
the regular IM process, and these have been vetted. Uh, but if it's a new technology, it may not be classified as IM process. Ah. At the time, well, we ha that had to keep coming. You know, the, the, right, the question is, if, if you don't have the guidance, right, for a brand new technology, uh, it's not so much, um, you know, we had to keep adding to it, that's right. There's, there's a number of projects that I'm not going to mention that we did that, that, are, that were classified and are classified, and, um, and because of these properties that we have of the radar, and of course they don't want it known how, how good it is or where it's being used and so forth. So I'm not going to go into those, but these are ones that it was okay, right, They're for scientific inf information or, or others. And good question. Yes, sir. No, that no, yeah, that happened to be the fragments of that one. I don't know what the upper limit is. I'm certain it's higher than that. Um, it has to do with the pulse rate, right? You can and and the distance. So your pulse rate, that is how often the pulse goes, right? If, you, if you're doing it ten thousand times a second, well, um, then it puts an upper limit on it, and that pulse rate is going to depend on how what the range is you want to measure. If you want to measure out a mile. You, you better not be going at 10,000 a second because it's, it, it, you may not get the pulse back in time. I, I don't know what the exact numbers, but the point is that, that you kind of work out those details. This was a very short range, so I'm sure it can go much faster than that, but this is what we measured it with. We also, uh, <laughs> since it's small and whatnot, uh, one of our technicians came up, Mark Vigers, I think, came up with the he had a, uh, just a regular housing for a, for a flashlight and put a radar in it. And um, so this was kind of an idea to search for people behind walls and make sure that you could, you could uh, or even measure their movement, breathing, and so forth. And uh, so that, we built a few of those to, to test them out. And uh, it goes through, you know, regular walls and so forth. Uh, and we even tested this and other technologies at what was called Disaster City. This is after Oklahoma City uh, bombing. There was a real interest in being able to find, you know, breathing and, and things under rubble. So we actually, you know, we went out. This is, I think it's South Bay somewhere. Um, they have a, set up a, what they call Disaster City. Uh, and you can go in there and crawl into things. And it's, it's shored up and it's not going to fall. And uh, you can test out your technologies and make sure that it works. Um, so that, and these are clearly, you know, people, our guys, you know, who went down and lay underneath and just sort of lay there. And, but they could still measure the breathing, uh, you know, through concrete and so forth. Kind of cool. And then, of course, 9-11 uh, happened. I, I happened to be in, uh, in Canada. I was at a conference in Windsor, Ontario when that happened. And, but the guys here and uh, this, this group here, and John Chang is in Washington today, but he's, he, he helped with a lot of this talk. Um, he was one of the guys that went back there. And they, it's pretty amazing, you know, there was no, fly, no aircraft flying. So they got a, got a DOE chartered an aircraft right away. And this is all because of laboratory uh, management, you know, thinking this was an important thing to do loaded all their stuff, their gear on that thing, and flew to New York like the day after, after something like that. They ended up getting into the rubble pile uh, by the third day, which is pretty amazing if you think about all the stuff that, to get there. And of course, they, they didn't find anybody at that point, but they could you know, verify hidden chambers, and um, you know, it wasn't meant to be a testing run, but it was, they, they got a lot of testing out there, and, uh, and they did a lot of work. It was pretty amazing. Joanne was our admin that time, and she really helped a lot. And I have to say the management of the lab was up to the director. They, they were very supportive of doing this. So that was uh, kind of an amazing time for all of us, right? Now, I haven't talked about too much about um, imaging, but just to give you an idea of what ultra-wideband, this impulse-type ultra-wideband gives you is... Uh, is, is a better beam forming. So if there's an array of narrowband antennas down here and another one of ultra-wideband, you can see it's much more fine 
it's like a, a spot in space that it can image, as opposed to narrowband uh, SAR, synthetic aperture radar, and that kind of thing. Um, so we use that for a lot of different things. Here's one. To, we had a radar camera, we called, and to see behind barriers. So there was more of those. There's an array of them. Uh, here's, here's an example of one that you could uh, see things behind the walls. And then we did tomographic reconstruction. Here's what the raw data looks like, but you can you know, reconstruct given the wavelength that we have and, and get pretty good images of, of, uh, of things of people. We didn't have the comp computational power to do that in real time, but that's getting close as well. Uh, oh, we did a lot of mine detection testing and, and so forth in uh, many different scenarios funded by the Army at Fort, Fort Belvoir. We, we went, there's a landmine site, a Nevada test site at Fort AP Hill. We even went to Cambodia for, uh, to see how they do it in the field for anti-personnel mines. It's difficult for metal detectors to detect a plastic mine. It, you can't find it, right? And a lot of these are plastic. They have very little metal in them. So MIR was used for that. Unfortunately, it does find a lot of clutter, too. So it'll, if you have a hole in the ground or a root or a rock, it can maybe look like a mine. So it needs to be done with other, with other technologies. And, uh, and we worked with various companies to try to do that as well. Um, but but we got some pretty good imaging of, of uh, anti-tank mines and, and even anti-personnel mines, which are pretty small. And then this was maybe the coolest thing. I, I know Jim Candy liked this one, but uh, we worked with Federal Highways Administration to make a bridge imaging system and, and uh, built this trailer here. It's a little hard to see, called Hermes. And here's the bottom side with pairs of 64 pairs of radar antennas, and, they, and uh, so it's transmitting into the ground, and you can measure what was in there, and this is what the kind of the raw data looked like, and then you could look, you know, six inches down into the concrete and see the rebar mesh pretty clearly. Now, we could drive over it at 55 miles an hour and collect the data at that speed, but it took several hours to reconstruct it all and get these kinds of images and things. So you drive over the bridge, collect the data, and, and go. There's a fair amount of computational power for the time in that trailer. And Federal Highways was impressed and they liked it. We had a low speed version of it. It goes 55 feet per hour, uh, much slower, but got much better imaging. And uh, we tested this in several bridges in Minnesota and California. And, and, uh, th and this one was kind of nice because it was, um, it was about to be resurfaced. So they were going to take the whole surface off. We got in there ahead of that and did the imaging of it before and were able to kind of see how it compared to the real thing once they took it off. It was, Caltrans was very helpful in that one. It was up by uh, Redding, California. Uh, oh yeah, and then there's a fair amount of work on speech recognition. That, and I was not involved with much with this, but, the, but you could imagine having radar, uh, along with an acoustic microphone, a radar is here in maybe difficult, noisy environments. You can, you can actually uh, get different kinds of signals off the glottal radar and the jaw radar and you know various different things it's it's uh, no health concerns or whatever but um, uh, but you can continuous verification and of course you can measure vital signs and things too it was a funny story but speaking of uh, of edward teller early on at one point tom was invited summoned i don't know to up to edward teller's office dr teller had an office up in Top of 111, a beautiful office apparently. Uh, maybe you've been there, I don't know. But, uh, and, and it had you know, a big table there with this, a table that uh, Dr. Teller had had discussions with Einstein and, and others about nuclear weapons and they had had it. You know, it's just an amazing place. And uh, so he invited, him to, invited Tom to, to show him what the radar was like, you know. And, and so he bought all his toys and the oscilloscope and you could see what was happening, and, and Dr. Teller liked it. And then he saw the heartbeat monitor. They had a heartbeat monitor you put here, and it could just measure. It actually you know, goes a little bit into the skin, and so you can measure the heartbeat. Uh, and he was fascinated by it. So he put it up there, and he, he you know, told Tom to be quiet, and he just sort of sat there for a few minutes, kind of watching, moving it around. And Tom's going, I don't know what I'm supposed to do here. And, uh, and finally, he, Finally, Dr. Teller, he was about 90 at the time, I think. So, uh, I'm not sure how old he was at the time. 
But finally, he put it down. He said, I knew it. My doctors have been lying to me. I have arrhythmia. <laughs> and Tom goes, oh, uh, you know, this, this is not licensed radar. This is, <laughs> this is nothing that had, you know, FDA approval at all. And he's going to go back to his doctor. And, you know, so Tom kind of got out of there quick. <laughs> it was pretty, a pretty funny story. Um, but it's, it can be used for a lot of biometric devices. And so here's, here's some idea. Clearly, the vital signs. We actually tried it in a helicopter. That's Lee Haddad. Remember that? Lee? You guys? He was in a helicopter. And, and you know, it's, it's not uh, affected by the noise or the motion in the helicopter very much at all just because it's radar. But there was other things like uh, hematoma detector, right? If you have a, in, in an accident and you have head trauma, um, it, it actually you know, could, could find a lot of that. And the same with the chest, chest trauma pneumothorax. Um, it had 90% accuracy on 53 patient trials in Detroit that they did. So that was pretty good. And the voice sensing, I already mentioned that. Um, oh, it, that's right. It, the hematoma detector actually won a, an award in 2011. FLC to protect transfer, and here's the team that, that did that. So, uh, so that was that was pretty nice. And they're still working this issue, by the way, with Georgetown and UC uh, Davis and, and UCSF. And so there, there's still work that's going on in this whole area. I didn't say much about communications, but um, and partly as some of that is end up end up being classified work, but. Uh, besides being, if you, can, if you can have a receiver separate from the transmitter, radar is you set receivers right near and you send a pulse out and you measure it coming back. For communications, you need to send it out and the receiver's got to hear it and it got to sync with it. You've got this impulse that's way below noise. How are you going to do that? Well, uh, several of our engineers here figured out a, a great way to do that, actually, uh, and patented that and then they, they have... Uh, gone on to do a lot of work in, in communications. And they, this is continuing on. There's still the, the Creta with this company, Dirac Solutions, Inc., owned by Rick Tugood, <laughs> as it turns out. And uh, they are making not only communications devices that work in these very difficult environments, like you know around con containers or on metal ships. I mean, narrowband has a hard time with all of these, right? In, in tunnels, this is where multipath kills you, too, in a tunnel. They did actually tested in the Transamerica Pyramid. They went to different floors, and they could communicate with one another fine with the ultra-wideband radio. Um, and, and so that worked great. And then they also built these RF tags. They're continuing to build these, uh, some for, for NNSA, actually, for nuclear materials. You want to track them. Uh, they are batteryless. They don't, they, uh, don't require any power. And uh, they use ultra-wideband communications, impulse to talk to one another. And uh, that's, that's pretty great. They're still working on it. And this is probably the one with the highest uh, funding at this point um, that's still going on. Uh, Reg Beer had, had been running this program, now Stephen Bond. Is Stephen here? He's not here. Um, and uh, they call it my radar because they call it multi-static imaging radar. Uh, the difference between this and, and something like Hermes, like the, ra the roadbed thing, is that, uh, well, you have, you have an array in front of these things. They built several. They've done a number of tests, done well in a number of tests. They even have a, this is an array of seven radars sitting on a drone, and so they actually do, that's new. They're doing some testing with that now. Um, but they're getting, uh, by multistatic, you, you transmit on one, on one uh, antenna, and you receive on all. Hermes was transmit on one, receive on one, and you go to each, each one separately. So this is, you get a lot more diversity of information and, um, and better imaging, and they're doing it in real time. So you can drive down the street slowly <laughs> and, uh, and look for buried threats, IEDs, and so forth. And the Office of Naval Research is funding this in a big way uh, now. So uh, this is, you probably maybe see these over in Building 181. They have uh, some of these trucks are out there, and they've been doing a lot of good work in this area. Okay, so that's kind of a summary of a lot of the a lot of the work that we've been doing over the years, and what MIR is kind of meant to the laboratory and to me personally. Um, it's it's storied 
25 year history. And, the, and kind of the question that came up, I, I think just in putting this together and, and talking with everyone is, is you know, how, how would you replicate it or how can you make this happen again? And, you know, it's a pretty unique situation. We had an inventor that came up with something that was brand new and extremely popular with a lot of market potential. And, and it ended up with many different, it wasn't just one technology, there's many different, there were 24 patents in that license uh, portfolio. So, and that inventor had good support from our laboratory and, uh, you know, a lot of imagination from, from a lot of people here, good management support and timing. So, you know, I'm not sure how you would beat it except promote good people doing these kinds of work. I know there's a lot of people here that invent stuff all the time and are coming up with good ideas, and so we should, we should do more of that. Um, just to finish up with Tom, I got a picture of him. This is a recent photograph of Tom. He's now an astrophotographer. He's got his own astronomy set up in his backyard in Santa Fe, enjoying life, and inventing and doing a lot of different things. But I really love the last, you know, one of, one of the last things he sent in his email to me was uh, lately I've been thinking, what, what if all of this is a prelude to something bigger? And right by this, he meant the MIR. What if it's, there's more? You know, he's 75 years old. He's still thinking about more stuff. For one thing, I'm going to try to get nuclear spin echoes out of a material. Maybe the world needs a $10 magnetic resonance sensor. I thought, how cool is that? <laughs> he's still going. So, uh, so all, you know, more power to him. I, 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 uh, it, was it was really great to talk to him. I actually got to talk to him on the phone, too. Sounds the same. And, uh, and it was really fun to reminisce, except for the time domain stuff. That wasn't so fun to reminisce about. <laughs> right, Steve? <laughs> okay, anyway, thank you very much, everybody, and uh, I'll take any questions. Thanks. <laughs>